Well, in the lighting of our Advent candle, we heard about the birth of Jesus and the angels going to the shepherds and announcing the good news, and we're going to unpack that a little bit today, but it reminds me of a kind of a story. There was a little girl, she's about four years old, and her name was Jessica, and Jessica had just had the best Christmas ever. I mean, she her Christmas list that she told to Santa, every single present was there under the tree. She got everything she wanted. Family came over to visit, and all her cousins were there to celebrate the Christmas day, and, and just, it was amazing. And there was all that food, the good stuff. I'm not talking about, you know, the stuff that's good for you, like, you know, the potatoes and the turkey and everything. I'm talking about the really good food, cookies and cupcakes and candy and brownies and all the other treats. And Jessica just had the bestest Christmas ever. As she went to bed that night and her mom tucked her in, Jessica told her mom, she said, Mom, I sure hope Joseph and Mary have another baby next year. Well, we know from history that Joseph and Mary did go on to have other children, but this first child that was born was a special child, right? A very special child because it was the uh, fulfillment of a promise made to all of us, and it was a special birth between Mary and God, conceived by God through Mary. And so it was a special thing. And tonight, I want to introduce to you, as we think about the whole Christmas story, with we started with John the Baptist, and remember, I'm going to copyright this, so don't go stealing this idea. I'm going to add a John the Baptist to everyone's nativity scene. Remember that, right? We talked about Mary last week, but tonight, and Joseph, we've hit on a little bit, but we've talked about shepherds now, and there's angels all over, and all kinds of things that are happening. But the real star of the show is who? Jesus. But, you know, I, I said it the other week when I was talking about the 1.3 million Christmas lights at our house, and how, you know, we travel around, Tammy and I travel around to see the Christmas displays, but we always are amazed that probably 90 or maybe even more don't have a manger scene. They don't have a nativity. The same is true when you think about how we celebrate the holiday. The star is missing a lot of time. The star of the show forget and we make it about other things and because we make it about so many other things not only do we miss the point but I think it robs us of a special gift that God has planned for us during this time of year it's the fulfillment of a promise the star fulfills the promise you know just to kind of go back to the absence of of Christ in Christmas that well it's a fact I won't say it's an opinion. Uh, I won't say it's a perception. It's a fact. Because 20 years ago, they did a study. Now, they did this study by watching like a zillion hours of TV during the Christmas, Advent, Christmas time. And they found out, you want to take a percentage guess on what percentage, this is 20 years ago, remember, what percentage Jesus had in all of the media on television 20 years ago? What percentage do you think Jesus had? 40? 5? I'm saying 1 back from the back. The lower you were, the closer you are. 3% of all of it focused on the star of the show. Wow. You know what? I've said this before, I'll say it again, I'm sure. People need Jesus. They need the star of the show, front and center, the promise of God 
fulfilled in the birth on Christmas Day. It's not the lights, the presents, the gifts, the gatherings. It's none of that. The star, the show needs to shine brightly. Today we're going to talk about that. The star of the show and why we need Jesus. You see, the simple thing is you need Jesus because there's a problem in the world, right? What's that problem? Sin. Now, nobody likes to talk about sin, and I'm embarrassed to say that early in my ministry career, I would almost choke on that word. I would come up with words like stumbling blocks, shortcomings. But the fact is, there's a sin problem, and we need the star of the show. So there's a need. And God gave us, because of our need, God gave us a promise. Who do you think that promise is? Jesus. You see, we couldn't save ourselves. We needed something beyond ourselves. And so part of God's plan was the fulfillment of a promise in Jesus. People need Jesus. Why? Because the problem of sin in our lives and in the world. Now, why did he do this? You see, there's a problem, a need. He provides a provision. For every provision, there's a promise. And for every promise, there's a plan. What's the plan? The promise of Christmas reveals the plan that God desires a relationship with you. That he does not wish anyone to perish, but wants to save the world for his purposes. To restore what was broken. To restore those things that we value so much that are emphasized in the Advent wreath. Peace and love and hope and joy. So for every, this is James Merritt's words actually, for every provision, God provides a promise and for every promise, God provides a plan. You look at the birth narrative and it's exactly what happened, right? The angel appears to Joseph and Joseph believed. The angel appeared and came upon Mary, or the Holy Spirit came upon Mary, and Mary conceived. And what was conceived was realized and received Jesus Christ. God provided, promised, or there was a provision made for a need, he provided a promise, and then gave it to fulfill a plan. All of that. And that's what we're going to unpack today, because that's what the world really needs. The world really needs that one person, Son of God, wrapped in a manger, and a promise what that means for each of us today, right? Well, you know, we need to do a few things, and the first thing we need to do is accept God's promise of satisfaction. Now you might think, where's that coming from? Let me explain. You know, the Christmas story has angels everywhere, right? Joseph gets an angel, an angelic visit. Mary gets an angelic visit. Uh, There's angels that appear to the shepherds. There's angels in the night of the birth. There's angels everywhere, and they all have a message. But the message to the shepherds was this. Listen to this very closely. Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. You know, there's this belief out there, I think, and even I've run across Christians who still believe this, that God is in the bad news business. And that's sort of my job, too, as a representative of God. I'm supposed to give you the bad news. That's really not how it works. God and preachers are not in the bad news business. God is in the good news business. Right? He doesn't, he's not up there waiting for you to just step out of line to zap you with a lightning bolt. There was an episode of The Simpsons that had that, you know, like a giant finger came from the sky and zapped them all. God is in the good news business. And because he's in the good news business, he wants to bring us a special gift. That can only be obtained in a relationship with him. You want to guess what that gift is? The angel said it, and if you were listening clearly, it might have caught it. 
What is it? I want to bring you great news of, good news of, great joy. Right? God isn't here to judge us, but to give us joy. And do you know where joy comes from? Besides God. Jesus. Besides Jesus. It comes when we're satisfied, right? When we're content. The reason that there's so much little joy in the world today is we're not really content, are we? we? We live in the greatest nation of the world. Now, we have our issues and our problems and our struggles and all that, but all that aside, we still live in the greatest nation of the world. It's the wealthiest nation, the most prosperous nation. Uh, anything you need, you can pretty much get. You don't go hungry, you probably have more than one car. You live in a big house with heat and air conditioning and running water and everything else. All the luxuries that third world people wish they had. We are highly blessed, but despite it all, nobody's happy. Nobody's satisfied. We're all longing for the next big thing, the next uh Big event, the next thing that's going to bring us what we think is going to be joy, but no, it always falls short. You know, I remember as a teenager, you, you go through that transition, right? I mean, Christmas morning for people like Je Jessica in my opening illustration, every Christmas is the best Christmas ever, right? Because there's so much excitement and you get all these things you want, and then all of a sudden, you become a teenager. Now, that's not to say, but this is me, maybe. Maybe it's only me. But I went from a whole host of presents under the Christmas tree to a single envelope. Now, I like money, just like the next person likes money, but that was pretty lackluster. You know, a dozen presents under the tree to an envelope with money. And it usually had some smart comment, like, don't spend it all in one place. It just seemed like it was lackluster, and I always lamented, and I, you know, Tammy teases me about the fact that, and I'm well known for being the Grinch. And that is part of the reason right there. Not happy. What I've discovered, though, is I was missing the point. I was looking for satisfaction in the material things about Christmas. What I was going to get out of it. The new fishing pole, the bicycle, the hottest new toy on the market, whatever it was, that's what I was looking forward to at Christmas. And I was missing it. Totally. Because I could be happy with the money in the envelope, but it didn't bring me joy. The only thing that would have brought me joy back then, which I've discovered now, is the fulfillment of the promise. Knowing who the promise is. Knowing that Christmas, as the Grinch would say, was more about, less about feasts and presents and jingle jangles and dingle dangles and all that. It's about Jesus. If you want to have joy, you focus in on Jesus and not the things that you have or don't have or don't get. The things that God provides for us in life. The relationship with Jesus brings us that joy. There's happiness, right? That's temporary stuff. I get a new fishing lure at Christmas, I'm happy. I get Jesus joyful. There's a big difference. You see, we got to accept the fact that Jesus meets that need, our deepest need for satisfaction. In fact, the psalmist David wrote, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not. Christmas is about good news. But we still have this problem, right? My problem was I missed the point of Christmas, but we talked about the fact that 
We all live in a broken world and there's sin in the world and we get frustrated with some of that sin on the big level and sometimes we struggle with sin in our own lives. There was a promise that God made to us in the beginning. And all those promises are fulfilled in Jesus. He gave us the, problem, the, the promise of satisfaction, but he also gave us promise of salvation. Provision. See, this is what the angel said. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a savior. Think about that. Savior. Not a teacher. Not a philosopher, not an economist, not a government leader, Savior. Savior, who is Christ the Lord. You know, we all fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us has sinned, but we have to realize that we need salvation. That we have to live, that our ways don't work. I don't know, I, you all know, and I've confessed it even recently, that I am very stubborn. That's probably an understatement. Tammy just rolled her eyes and she's shaking her head. I am, as, I mean, I am so stubborn that that, that I will do things that are self-destructive and a detriment to my own well-being just because I don't want to. That's true. But it takes a long time. You see, all of us, maybe not to the extreme of, of my own life, but all of us are stubborn in some aspect or another. We're more comfortable living in the sin and the shortcomings and everything else that's got us in an entangled mess and imprisoned in life, then we are just simply accepting the key that Jesus is in our lives and letting ourselves out of the prison. Doesn't make sense. That's how it works. So you got to recognize that Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise, that he's the remedy, that he is the solution to sin and brokenness in this world. He's your savior. He's the one that holds the key that can set you free from whatever it is that imprisons you. Whatever it is that's holding you back in life or holding you back from a deeper relationship with God. He's the gift. The one true meaningful gift of Christmas. Merritt wrote on, he said, we all love to receive gifts at Christmas, but a gift is worthless unless you A, want it, you B, take it, Three, you open it, and four, you receive it. You know, I don't know about you, but there have been a few Christmases in, in my experience where every gift, everybody's gathered together, it's Christmas Day, Christmas morning, whatever, all the gifts have been delivered, but I come back home or there's whatever Christmas tree's there, there's a gift there. A gift. That's unopened. That nobody got. That nobody received. I remember when I was a kid, uh, speaking of envelopes, every kid in our family, and every relative, got an envelope that was put into the Christmas tree. And in order to get the envelope, you had to show up and take the envelope off the tree. How many people are caught in that predicament? 
You got to show up to receive the blessing. And then to receive the blessing, you have to receive the blessing to get the blessing. But yet, our world, ourselves maybe, are so stubborn at times that we don't accept the greatest gift that God, the priceless gift that God offers us. It's left under the tree. It's left on the tree. It's left unopened. It's left unreceived. God gives us a promise, and his desire is that you and everyone else receives that gift so that you're free to live the abundant life that Jesus promised, the new life, the eternal life, and all the blessings like joy and peace and love and hope that come receiving that gift. Well, with every vision, there's a promise. With every promise, there's a purpose. And we have to accept God's purpose. And the purpose we have to accept is serenity. And you're probably shaking your head and going, well, what do you mean, serenity? We know that the birth of Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise. And he lived and he taught and he showed us who God was. And then through his life, death, resurrection, he reconciled us to God. In that gift of reconciliation, because God gave it all for us, we can have a relationship with God. We don't need to go between. We don't need to be afraid of God any longer. We have the, the promise that sin has lost its power. And as the angel said, listen to this, glory to God on the highest and on earth, Peace. Serenity is peace among humanity with whom God is pleased. Provision was there was sin in the world and we needed a cure. Jesus is the promise that cures us and breaks the hold of sin in our lives. And the purpose is to make us at peace with God and peace with one another. Yeah? How much peace do you think is in the world today? We're at odds with everything, it seems like, right? You lit, let me just tell you this. Watch 20 minutes of news every day. That's it. Because in that 20 minutes, you're going to get everything you need. The rest of the day is a repeat of the first 20 minutes. And all it does is get you all wound up tighter than a drum and discouraged and ticked off at everybody because there's so much division. There's, there's racial tension. There's uh, gender divisions. There's uh, political disagreements. There's wars that are going on. There's injustice that's happening. There's oppression that's occurring. And there's corruption that's taking place. And you get so overwhelmed with that that you forget that God came to earth as the form of Jesus Christ to bring peace and serenity. Now, if you've received that gift of serenity, a marvelous thing happened. We back up. Christmas time. Holiday. Now, I said this in the Bible study. It's going to shock you, probably. But part of the problem about Christmas is that our culture puts a lot of emphasis on family. It's all about family. Baloney. Because we put our emphasis on family, we have no peace. Because why? How many of you? In your family, everyone gets along. They're all Democrat. They're all Republican. They all think the same. There's no disagreements. There's no, well, I remember that last Christmas, and you don't know. No. How many of you have family issues, family problems? You put the emphasis on family, guess what? You don't have any peace, do you? Because even if the argument doesn't break out and somebody doesn't get a face full of mashed potatoes, 
tension still there in the room. You can cut it with a knife. You're just waiting for old Uncle Bud to do something ridiculous. Or your heart's broken because so-and-so's not there this We put the emphasis on the promise. Get serenity. And if you have the promise and you're living out the promise, God's purpose is that not only are you at peace with God, reconciled with God through your relationship with Jesus Christ, but you're reconciled with one another. That you just let this stuff go off your back like a duck. Like water on the duck's back. There you go. Right? You can only do that when the peace of God within you overflows to the point that it flows out of you. Maybe this Christmas, the greatest gift that you can give somebody is to let go. Let go of the Christmas 10 years ago when you got upset and insulted because Aunt Susie said something you didn't like. Let it go and focus on the promise. The peacemaker, the way maker, the promise keeper. Let it go. Make amends. Don't build more walls, but build a bridge. You know, it's amazing to me that so much of, of the promise of, of Jesus Christ is about forgiveness. The forgiveness of sin, mainly. But the forgiveness of our shortcomings and all of the things that we do stupidly because we're too darn stubborn to figure out that God's got the answer. Anyway, it amazes me that people will hold on to a grudge and be imprisoned by that grudge for years. I still hear stories, believe it or not, at Cassidy about pastor so-and-so. Okay, wait now. So you're upset because of something that happened 17 years ago with Pastor So-and-so. And he's been gone for 17 years? Yeah, I, let me tell you. If I were to see him, I'd give him a piece of my mind. I didn't do it 17 years ago, but I'm ready now. Let it go. God gives us the promise and the peace. He's reconciled us so that we can be reconciled with one another. All this division, all this lack of unity is a reflection of our great need for the promise to be fulfilled. Now, there's probably three different groups of people here today. There are those groups that knows Jesus and they're struggling and they're working on it and they're doing the best they can and God bless you. I don't mean that in a southern way. God bless you. Right? Because you're working at it. Keep going. Keep shining the light. Keep Jesus first in your life and it'll overflow into other things in your life. There's a second group of people that don't know Jesus. There's probably one or two in here. Now you believe in Jesus. You heard about him. And you know that Jesus was born on Christmas morning. But you're not really, you're still caught up in all the past stuff. You really haven't accepted him deep into your heart. You haven't really accepted the gift and opened the gift that God gives us. You're just holding on to that gift so you can hold on to your old way. Don't be a Pastor Tom. Don't be stubborn. And there's a third group, and you just simply have strayed away. You're worn out, you're weary, you want to rest, 
got a load full of problems, worries, anxiety, and concerns that you're trying to deal with and juggle and balance all at the same time, but you strayed so far away from Jesus that, well, that's not who you're turning to. Maybe it's time, if you're in that group, to turn back to Jesus. I don't know where you are in your spiritual journey. That's between you and God. I just know that God has made each and every one of us a promise. That we're as close to Him as we want to be. If you want to keep God at an arm's length distance, I guess that's your business. If you want to totally reject God, I guess that's your business. But I'm here to tell you that there's a gift that needs to be open. Everyone's life. And that gift is Jesus. And if you draw close to Jesus and close to God, I can guarantee you your life will turn around and be 100% better than it ever was. I'll give you a money-back guarantee. Whatever you put in the offering plate today, I'll give it back to you if I'm telling a lie. You've got to open the gift. I hope that you receive that gift this Christmas hope that if you're in one of those three groups that you'll hit the altar during communion and pray. Remember, only as close to God as you want to be. The gift is there waiting to be opened.